So we are uh, again here uh, in the book of Matthew. We are still in chapter 5 because uh, we don't want to rush through God's word, right? We don't want to rush. We want to make sure that we get to soak in as much as we can. And um, so we're still here in chapter 5 with another. Uh, you heard that, huh? So this is uh, part 6. If you're keeping up with you heard that, huh? This is part 6. And uh, uh, again, from the Sermon on the Mount. Who's preaching the Sermon on the Mount? Jesus. Jesus. We just sang about him. Uh, you're my everything. You're, you're my rock. You're my redeemer. You're all these things, right? Why would we want? Why would we not want to listen to this guy, right? We want to live. If we if we really mean all those things that we just declared about him in that song, right? The person I go to when I'm in trouble, right? When times are like, who? This guy, who is God in the flesh, and his name is. And this is who is speaking here. So we're going to get into God's word. We're going to jump into God's word right away. If you're ready to jump, say jump. Yeah. All right, Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 42. Um, this is where we are. Jesus here. He, he's, before I get into this, I want us to understand what he's addressing here. Jesus is addressing retaliation. This is what he's addressing, retaliation. Anybody familiar with retaliation? And if you have siblings at home, you fully understand retali retaliation, right? Uh, you ain't going to do that to me and chase each other around the house and you hit me, I'm going to hit you back, right? You understand what I'm talking about, right? Fully. Like, I, I get it. Like, I live it every day. I understand retaliation. But here we go. This is what Jesus has to say about it, which is super important. He says, uh, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, it's that, it's that you heard that huh? moment. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak <coughs> as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs uh, from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. How high are Jesus' expectations of us? But, but what? behind this is the reason okay can, I, I know we've talked about this and it's been assumed like in some of the service some of the messages I just want to make it really clear why Jesus his expectations for us are so high and it's, and it's just it, we're in this section you heard that huh section Jesus is gonna he's gonna tell us that look it's really perfection that's really the expectation. The expectation is perfection. Now, how many of us in here fall short of that expectation? This right here, this hand raise right here is the reason why Jesus is to say, I can't do it. I can't meet it. Because at the end of that, now Jesus can say, but I can meet it for you. Mm -hmm. When you get to that point of do it, Jesus can't say, I can do it for you, or I will do it for you, or I have done it for you, like any of those. That's why his expectations are so high. And so, he's, so he has these religious leaders, right, who are, who are leading the people, who are teaching the people, and they're doing it. And so he's... <laughs> He's like, look, this is what your this is what your tradition has said. It is said, get even. It is said that um, an eye for an eye, two for a tooth, right? That's what it has said. But I'm telling you something different, and we're going to get into that. So again, we're dealing with the subject of retaliation. So I, I, I um, when Jesus says in verse 38, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, two for the tooth. When Jesus says these words, right? We've discussed that he's referring to rabbinic 
traditions and interpretations of, of some law that was given by God through Moses. I mean, really, that's what he's doing right here in the Sermon on the Mount. And so we know that we are going to find these words that Jesus is quoting here. We're going to find these words in Scripture. They're there, right? Or otherwise he wouldn't be saying, you, you have heard, right? They're there. So it's not that the words are wrong. It's the rabbinic tradition and interpretation. And that's what Jesus is really trying to set straight, right? Because it's honestly, it's about the heart of the matter. It's about the heart, and again, Jesus is getting to that. We can, so we can find these things. The first, first place, or one of the places that we, we're going to find these is in Exodus chapter 21, verses 21 through 25. And this is what it says in Exodus. It says, when men strive together and hit a pregnant woman... So, you, so two men are fighting, and a, a pregnant woman gets struck in the middle of the fight, right? That, that's really what it's saying. So if when, men are stri when men strive together and hit a pregnant woman so that her children come out, but there is no harm, then the one who hit her shall surely be fine as the woman's husband shall impose on him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. Okay? So that's one of the places that we find. Or he's addressing here. Then another place we find is in Leviticus chapter 24, verses 17 through 20. It says, whoever takes a human life shall surely be Whoever takes an animal's life shall make it good, life for life. If anyone injures his neighbor as he has done, it shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Whatever injury he has given a person shall be given to him. We understanding the rules? If you stab me, what happens to you? That's right. That's it. You break my arm, what happens to you? You get your arm. Like, this was, this was the law. Okay, another place, and we're, we're going to get it. We're really going to get into this, okay? Another place, Deuteron Deuteronomy chapter 19, verses 16 through 21. This is what it says there. It says, if a malicious witness arises to accuse a person, then both parties to the dispute shall appear before the Lord, before the priest and the judges who are in office in those days. The judges shall inquire diligently, and if the witness is a false witness and has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him as he had meant to do to his brother. So you shall purge the evil from your midst, and the rest shall hear and fear, and shall never again commit any such evil among you. Your eye shall not pity. It shall be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Right? So I, we, we can see this actually lived out. One of the places that we see this lived out is in Judges chapter 1, verses uh, 6 through 7. So this is uh, after Judah and Simeon had uh, risen up against the Canaanites and the Perizzites, okay? And they'd overtaken them, and they found their leader, uh, Abdonai Bezek, okay? And that's his name. Abdonai Bezek fled, so he ran from them, but they pursued him and caught him and cut off his thumbs and his big toes. Seems kind of brutal, huh? They cut off his thumbs and his big toes. And Adonai said, 70 kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off used to pick up scraps from under my table. As I have done, so God has repaid me. And they brought him to Jerusalem and he died. So why was his thumbs and toes cut off? Because he did that to other people. He did that to other people. How, how many others did he do that to? It says here, 70 kings. 70. This is, this is what we need to understand.
understand about this, okay? Because if we can look at this as being very harsh, right? An eye for an eye, really? Like, what if it was an accident? What if, listen, these were the laws that, so this is what was allowable. It did not mean that it, that it had to happen, but this was allowable under the law. Like, if it did go to that, then it was considered like, okay, we're even. A lot of times, instead, people would pay money. It's like Affleck, right? You break your arm, Affleck, right? But, then, <laughs> but that's what would happen, right? People would pay, well, people would pay money instead of, it was just like when we talked about marriage and divorce. Divorce was allowable under adultery, right? But not command. You didn't have to do it. You, you had, you, you had, you could choose to forgive. You could choose to let it go. You could, like, if you could do that. But this was what was allowable because in our hearts. Also, um, by matching the punishment to the crime, it also prevents excessive punishment. Because we know that when something is done to us, the rage that comes out of us sometimes, we would probably want more justice than what was necessary. We would want more than that, right? In our natural human mindset and instincts. And so these were basically limitations. So not that you had to do this, but this was the limit of what you could do. This was it. Nothing beyond that. And so you can think, you can think about how uh, evil and vengeful that we are in our natural state, right? When we're not operating by the Spirit, which is sometimes very difficult when bad things happen to us. Am I, am I speaking any kind of truth here? Anybody else struggle with this stuff? Just me? Am I all by myself? Like, a great example of somebody cutting you off in traffic. <laughs> what you will do to them is all of the You'll naturally, because you don't want them to ever do that again. So you may be honking and flashing your lights and telling them they're number one, all those great things. And all they did was just get in front of you and cause you to slow down. Right? It's a good or bad example? Good? Okay. I knew I've seen you guys driving around town, so I knew it was a mistake. So as you can see in these passages, God is already concerned with retaliation. So what they do is, what that law did was it prohibited disproportionate revenge, is what it did. It put a boundary. It put a boundary there. Like, don't go outside this boundary. But now Jesus is sort of changing the boundary, right? Because again, he's, it's about the heart. And so he changes the boundary. So Jesus uses this word, but I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. How many, uh, just, just a quick poll real quick. How many of you like this verse? Anybody? Uh, you know, these are, these are the difficult ones. Because, because we've given our life to Christ, you and I are called to a different standard. We are. And now Jesus is laying down the standard, and we're like, well, I don't like that standard. Well, he's like, I'm, you know, if you'll just do it, I will help you. If I ever heard the scripture before, revenge is mine, saith the Lord. See, I think this is, this is be, again, it's another trust issue with God. We don't trust God to handle it. We have to do something. How dare the person disrespect me like that? But if we would just remember in those moments that God, God will take care of it. God is a God of justice, okay? He will um, take care of it. It's important here to note that when, when Jesus says, do not resist an evil person, Jesus is not requiring us to be pacifists. 
or to never resist evil forces. In, in James chapter 4, verse 7, James says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. What? Resist the devil. Is the devil evil? Yes. Absolutely. Does the devil work through people? Yes, yes he does. So, so resist that and he will flee from you. Uh, also in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 through 9, uh, Peter tells his church, he says, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, is he evil? It's in his name. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. What are we supposed to do? Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. So it's not that we're not ever to resist evil forces. We need to fully understand that if a believer or his loved ones are threatened or attacked, it is not wrong to take up defense and take appropriate justice against the wrongdoer. Jesus is not saying that. He, uh, what Jesus does not require by commanding us not to resist a little person is to not what, sorry, what he does require by commanding us not to resist an evil person is not to retaliate. That's what he's requiring. He's requiring that you don't retaliate. We, we do not respond as Christians, as believers in him, we do not respond by getting even. And when the offense is nothing more than a personal slight, we can ignore it all together. So if it's just a matter of disrespect, if it's just a matter of like, it's just this. I mean, that's really what Jesus means when he says the word slap. When Jesus says that we are to endure slap, he's speaking of a personal, any kind of personal slight of any kind. The slap, or if you've got a King James Version of the Bible, say smite. It does not have to involve a literal, literal physical violence. Uh, even in our day, when we, when we say the phrase, a slap in the face, what are we talking about? An insult, right? An insult. That was a, that was a slap in the face. Or uh, you got snubbed. <laughs> That's my favorite one. That's the one that just really get all riled up about, right? The snubbing. It's not about you. I was telling you, it's not about you. I'm telling you, if they're like me, they, they got something else on their mind. They're not snubbing you. But if that happens, what? Because of Christ, we can overlook that, right? But what, what do we want to do? We want to retaliate, right? We want to insult back. We want to, the next time I see them, I'm going to ignore them and let them see how it feels, right? I and mean, that's the whole thing. We, we want them to know how it feels. Right? It's not the way of the believer. Did someone insult you? Let him, Jesus says. Are you shocked and offended? Don't be. And don't return insult for insult. Jesus says, turn the what? Turn the other cheek. I'm not talking about somebody breaking in your house. I'm not talking about somebody beating you and robbing you in the Walmart parking lot, okay? So what turn the other cheek does not mean? Turn the other cheek does not imply, again, pacifism. I mentioned that earlier. So what is pacifism? I know what pacifism is, right? Late 60s, early 70s. Pacifism is the belief that any violence, including war, Justifiable under any circumstances, and that all disputes should be settled by peaceful means. And Jesus does not at all mean this to prohibit, when he says, the other cheek, he does not mean to prohibit self defense 
or the actions of a government to restrain evil. He was not setting government foreign policy here, nor was he throwing out the judicial system. Crimes can still be persecuted or prosecuted, and wars can still be waged. But the follower of Christ, he says, does not need to defend his personal rights or avenge his honor. That's what he's saying. He's saying, put your pride down, is what he's saying. Right? Turn the cheek also does not mean that we place ourselves or others in danger. Jesus' command to turn the other cheek is simply a command to forego retaliation for personal offenses. Steve, why are you talking about this so much? Because this is a very uh, often misinterpreted passage. And so I want us to have a clear understanding. What are the boundaries? And I'm after they will, we will have those. Because again, if you read this on the cuff, it's like, oh, well, I just have to lay down for everybody. I don't think that's what Jesus is really asking us to do. Retaliation is what most people expect and how worldly unsaved people act. And that's how we know that we are supposed to be the opposite of that. If the world reacts this way, if the world does these things, I probably need to be doing these things instead. Such an easy way to know whether I'm in the will of God or not. Listen, responding to hatred with love and ignoring personal slights displays the supernatural power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And it is a chance to share the gospel. What are we about? What's like, the, what's like the first few words of our mission statement? It, 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 it ends. What's the first part? To what? Oh, to glorify God. To glorify God. To glorify God. I'm going to say it six times. To glorify Guess what the expectation for you is? 
to practice what you preach, right? Because you were a follower of him. Like, again, this is, we're, wow. We're getting somewhere today. We are following him. And so, again, that's what we do. But he did that. He practiced what he preached. He was, when he was arrested and crucified, Jesus did not fight back or resist. He did not seek revenge or try and get even, right? He didn't do any of those things with, with his tormentors. Rather, he loved them and died for them. And he asked his heavenly father to forgive them for the wrong they committed. Luke chapter 23, verse 34. And Jesus said what? Father, forgive them, for they do not what they do. They do not know what they do. Exactly. That's what he said. So following Jesus' example, we should not resist an evil person. We too can choose to love and forgive those who have wronged us. Just some more scriptures on that. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6. This is prophesying about Jesus. It says, I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. Jesus was okay with being disrespected because it put God on display. In Matthew chapter uh, 26, 65 through 68, it says this. Going through, so that, that passage we just read in, in chapter uh, Isaiah 50, verse 6, this is what Jesus was going through in Matthew 26, 65 through 68. It says, Then the high priest tore his robes and said, He has uttered blasphemy. What further witness do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? And they answered, he deserves death. And then they spit in his face and they struck him. And some slapped him saying, prophesy to us, you Christ. Who is it that struck you? I don't. Some of you I know better than others. I don't know any of us who would stand for this kind of treatment but yet that's what Jesus is calling us to in 1 Peter uh, chapter 2 verses 23 uh, Peter says this when he was reviled he did not revile in turn Peter would know because he right when he was reviled he did not revile in return when he suffered he did not threaten but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Even Jesus like, hey, vengeance is mine, save the Lord. God's got this. I'm not going to worry. But because of that last scripture, Peter later says in chapter 3, verse 9 of 1 Peter, it says, do not, so he tells us, because Jesus did this, he tells us, so you do not repay evil for evil or revive reviling, but on the contrary, bless your call that you may obtain a blessing. We're getting into more of this next week with love your enemies and pray for your enemies and like it's going to go beyond well, even what we're talking about today. It's going to go beyond. Paul repeats this rhetoric in several of his letters to the churches. In 1 Thessalonians 5.15, he says this, See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. So this was passed on to the church leaders to tell the church, see to it. That means that we are supposed to hold each other. When it says to the church, see to it, we're supposed to hold each other accountable on this. So if I'm with you and, this, and something happens to you and you want to retaliate, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to talk to you out. I'm like, hey, don't do that. That's not what we're called to. Let it go. Let's go. We got other things to do. We got kingdom work to do. We can't worry about that. I had to do this a lot. I can't worry about that. Let's go. We, I, I'm on, God's got me on a mission. I got to be doing this. I can't deal with 
This, I don't have time. And plus, God hasn't called me to do anything about that. I just got to keep on. Romans chapter 12, verse 17. Again, Paul telling the church, Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. And again, what's the reason? God's glory. That's why we, that's why we do it and be careful to do what is honorable in the sight of all because we want to put God on display. And Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12, very clearly, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You got some evil things happening in your life? This is how you overcome it right here, with good. Do you, I mean, you got, do you believe God's word? If you believe God, then this is it. If you have evil things going on in your life, you overcome them by, I don't care what evil, what evil it is. It doesn't matter. Even your own sin. You overcome that with good. You replace it with something good. You know what that's called when we do it with our own sin? When we replace it with something good, it's called repentance. Gosh. Man, you guys are so smart. So proud of you. By not seeking revenge or retaliation against people who have personally wronged us, we, we are actually able to reveal to them what God is like. We're always searching for ways. Of, How can I share the gospel? How can I tell people what God is like? How? Show them. Show them. God, in his grace, does not retaliate against those who wrong him. He does not try to get even with sinners. Rather, God invites them into a relationship with himself and in Christ offers to forgive them of their sins. So that leads us to verse 40, right? Get there. Fast forward, fast mode, right? You guys ready? Speed reading. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. The tunic here is referred to the inner garment, carnally, uh, common. This is day. In modern terms, it's literally the shirt off your back. That's what it means. Instead of fighting them in court, Jesus tells his followers simply to give that person both your tunic and your cloak, which is the Christians can turn into an example of faithful strength. You guys, um, you guys remember uh, Paul's instructions to the church when it came to lawsuits? Y'all remember? Let's look at that. 1 Corinthians 6, 7. This is what Paul tells the church. It says, to have lawsuit, lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. So if you already... Like, again, within the church, if we, can't, if we can't figure it out in here, it's a defeat to us. And then he says this wonderful statement, which I love, because this is how we're supposed to be with each other, and this is also how we're supposed to be with those who mean evil on us. He says, why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded, he says. Just what, I mean... Paul is saying that if it comes down to you being wronged and defrauded or bringing shame upon God and his church, be wrong and defrauded. We don't, we're not to bring shame upon God and his church. Jesus also wants his followers to develop a servant mindset. As his followers are our spirit of servanthood must go beyond what is required and extend to those who mistreat you. And that leads us to verse 41. Jesus says, Then if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. We have a phrase about that, right? Go the extra mile. Oh, wow, I came from the Bible. Right? Go the extra mile. Now, what Jesus 
is describing here is a forced march of sorts. Like uh, this example was a clear reference to um, the Roman occupancy of Israel and the Romans who were often harsh and unfair uh, in their treatment of the Jewish people. And apparently Roman soldiers could grab any Jewish citizen they chose and force that person to carry luggage or other items for a standard of mile. And that kind of, kind of oppressive, invasive act would naturally inspire a hunger for can you imagine? I mean, you and I get so frustrated when our day gets interrupted, right? And what if it was from somebody who mistreated us and we, I don't know how long it takes to walk a mile. Right? Some of you guys can run it in four minutes or less, I'm sure. <laughs> but that, it would take that much time. You had to stop whatever you're doing and do this. And Jesus is actually saying, do, twice as, do at least twice as much. It did, culturally, it did, it would entice people to violently want to overthrow the Romans. And that's why Jesus is giving this example, because he knows the hearts of the people. He understands the, the, the want for retaliation inside the hearts. Some of Jesus' original audience uh, thought his goal as Messiah was to overthrow the occupiers and drive them out of Israel. And that would make his next command shocking. Don't refuse and do even more than you were asked. Now, depending on how this phrase is translated, it could even mean walk with them another two miles. So you could be walking three. But this verse also out of context and with cynicism, some hear appeasement and weakness in these words. But that's not what's being communicated. Human nature jumps to the assumption that Jesus means weakly surrendering to bullies and invaders. Instead, that's not what Jesus communicates. Instead, Jesus is describing a person strong enough to take control, strong enough to give to an enemy more than they asked for. Don't you realize? Don't, like, don't you see that? When he asks you to go a mile and you actually go two, who was in control of the first mile? Who was in control of the second mile? Me. You see, Jesus is actually telling us how to, how to approach that situation with strength and to be in control. And Jesus does not tell his followers to shrink and wither, even to the slap or the lawsuit or the abuse of authority. He tells them to demonstrate strength by freely giving away more than the enemy can take. This is a demonstration of power in the guise of submission. And nobody did that more perfectly than Jesus. This kind of response, again, makes it possible for God to demonstrate his goodness even in the face of those with evil intent. It's going to take a lot of trust to do this, right? To overcome these things. But this kind of response is literally invincible. What it does is it shouts in clear terms that their abuse and insults can't overcome the power and influence of Christ in our life. What a powerful witness. So now, so far, the overall idea of the previous verses is that followers of Jesus should overcome evil by freely giving themselves more than the evil person wants to take. And the picture Jesus has painted for us is that someone targeted by evil to be taken advantage of, and somehow the targeted person retains all the power in the exchange. And how he retains the power is not because it makes sense, but it's because the person does it God's way, overcoming their evil with God's goodness. Tony Evans um, says this. He says, according to Jesus, servanthood 
should be such a dominant orientation in the kingdom people that we are willing to go the extra mile even for people who don't like us. This doesn't involve placing yourself into an abusive situation, however, nor does it mean that there are no limitations. And now verse 42, finally, verse 42, Jesus gives us a different scenario. And this is another challenge to us because we like our things. We like our money. And I hear no disagreement, so it must be true. Right? We like our stuff. It's our stuff, right? It's my way. Where did it come from? Oh, so it's whose stuff? It's God's stuff. It's whose money? It's God's money. Now, he has allowed me to steward it. He's allowed me to take care of it. Let's see what God, let's see what Jesus says here in 42. He just says, hey, Give to the one who begs from you. And do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Now, if you think, again, Jesus is adding all this extra stuff. This is actually really common. It was supposed to be common among God's people. In fact, we read about it all the time in the Old Testament. This is just the way it was supposed to be from the get-go. And I think Jesus is really here. Instead of setting a new president, he's just reminding them, hey, no way for you guys to misinterpret this. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verses 7 through 11, it says this, it says, if among you one of your brothers should become poor, do you guys understand the situation? If among you one of your brothers should become poor, in any of your towns with your land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against your poor brother, but you shall open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his need, whatever it may be. Take care, lest there be an unworthy thought in your heart, and you say, the seventh year, the year of release is near. You understand what's happening? So there's a, there's a person in need, God said them, give to them, and don't be taken into consideration that next year is the year of Jubilee and you've got to forgive it. Right? He doesn't have to pay you back after next year. Like, don't let that rise up in your heart. Don't get bitter about it. God, well, what's the New Testament say? God loves a generous giver. Right. Okay, so again, same principle. So don't let that, don't let that thought get in your heart. And your eye look grudgingly on the poor brother, and you give him nothing, and he cried to the Lord against you, and you'd be guilty of sin. Wow. If you don't give to a brother in need, you're guilty of what? Ouch. You didn't know, you, you probably, you don't even think about that. You're just like, oh, I don't want to do it, or I can't do it, or whatever excuse you have, right? You shall, it says, you shall give to him what? Freely, and your heart shall not be grudging when you give to him, because for this, uh, because for this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all that you undertake. For there will never cease to be poor in the land. Therefore, I command you: you shall open wide your hand to your brother, to the needy, and to the poor in your land. In Psalms chapter 37, verses 21, in verse 21, Jesus says, The wicked borrows but does not pay back, but the righteous is generous and gives. So the, the, the other thing, this borrows but does not pay back, is on the other person. But what do the righteous people do anyway? They give generously. 
And then verse 25 and 26 in the same chapter of Psalms, it says, I have been young and now I am old, and yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. He is, ne he is ever lending generously and his children become a blessing. Again, in Psalm chapter 112, verses 5 and 6, it is well with the man who does generously and what? Lends. Who conducts his affairs with justice, for the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. And in verse 9 of that same chapter, speaking of this man, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted in honor. In Proverbs, uh, chapter 21, the book of wisdom, verses 25 and 26. This is just wisdom here. It says here, the desire of the sluggard kills him. So the people are lazy, it's on them, right? It's good, it's good. They're going to suffer from being lazy. The desire of the sluggard kills him, for his hands refuse to labor. All day he craves and craves, but the right... This is what God's people do. This is what not God's people do. Right? We're getting two examples here. Don't you guys getting the message? Luke chapter six, verses thirty-two through thirty-four. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. You are God's people. We operate differently. We operate differently. Again, Jesus is demonstrating that choosing to give us a powerful act because you have chosen, uh, he is demonstrating that choosing to give is a powerful act because you have chosen to do so. More importantly, you're choosing to trust God to continue to provide for you despite giving away what he has freely given to you. You can say, well, I worked for that money. Well, who told you to work? Who told you to work? God? Did God say to work? Yeah. He told us to work. Who gave you the job? God gave you the job. But if you keep all that stuff to yourself, how are you demonstrating that? Just as Jesus' words in the turn the other cheek in verse 39, just like those words, don't, le don't prohibit legitimate self-defense. So he's not saying don't protect yourself. This command here in verse 42 does not mean to be naive or gullible about charity either. I mean, in Matthew, Matthew 10, 16, Jesus tells his disciples, Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. It's okay to look for the writing on the wall, but I'm telling you, if, it's, if you're unsure, give and let God take care of it. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10, Paul says to the Thessalonian church, he says, For even when we were with you, 
we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. Why? Because God told us to work. So again, we're, we're, we're not to be, oh, what's, the, what's the psychological term for that? Enabler? We're not to be enablers. And somebody is unwilling to work. Now, big difference between unwilling and can't, right? And I know, I know, I know the faults in our government. I know our government system, the can't work um, definition is getting broader by the day. I get it. I, not your, not your concern uh, when it comes to dealing with people of what the government decided. We are to help each other. And I, you know, and I, and I have seen some great things like that done within this church. I have. Like, you guys, you guys have come through more and more and more, but do I think you come through more and more and more? Absolutely, I do. Absolutely, I do. And so what Jesus means here in verse 42 is that sacrificial, purposeful giving is the proper response when someone expresses a legitimate need. And we are supposed to answer that call. A lot to unpack this morning, right? But my, my hope for you, just like every week, is that the Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart and your mind. And it's, He's shown you, truthfully, where you are in each of these different things. Are you a person of retaliation? Are you a person of revenge? Are you a person of, oh no, she just did not talk to me that way? Oh, I know he didn't just snub me. He knows who I am. Why is he acting like that? Huh? Or are you one of those, I don't know, you know? They must be dealing with something. They must have not have seen me. Even though they looked right at me, they, I'm telling you, it happens to me all the time. I, in the grocery store. I, I'm telling you, if I'm on a mission, I can look right at you and not see you. Is there somebody that you know has a need and for whatever reason you've been reluctant to meet that? I really hope that the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart this morning and, and getting you to reconsider that and giving you confidence to give because God says, I'm in control. I'm in control. I don't think you're going to be punished by giving to somebody. I really think it would be the opposite. It's just, again, from what I get from the words of God. So, if you know of those things and you've been reluctant, would you reconsider this morning? Not based on me, not based on me asking, but basing on your understanding of Jesus' word through the power of the Holy Spirit, okay? Would you guys just commit that to each other this morning? Just saying, I, I'm going to do that. I, if I have the ability, I am going to do that. I love you guys so very much and again like I said earlier I, I do cherish this time so much I know that um, I know that we've gone over this morning a little bit I do think God is worth it and I just appreciate you guys staying with me um, today okay let's uh we'll stand and be dismissed please 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 come back tonight six o'clock you all right, we need you here because again, we can't disperse into the community without bodies. And so, please come tonight and be a part of our pray first meeting tonight at six o'clock, right here. All right, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you again so much for today. And God, we thank you so much for the truthfulness of your word. And God, we thank you that we can trust you 
if we follow that word. Even God, here's the good thing about you is if we're if we're trying to do this and we, and we mess it up or we make a mistake or whatever, you got that. Your grace covers that. You will help us even if we don't do it all the way correctly, God. If we're just trying and tr striving and trying to do thing without uh, going to you first, help us to not say no. When it comes down to uh, reacting to and, uh, and the mistreatment that others give us, God, when it comes down to that, help us not to react without first consulting you, God. What do I do here? Lord, again, help us to have self-control, which is the fruit of the Spirit, when it comes to these things, so that we can put you on display with our lives. Lord, as we leave here and as we, again, strive to walk in obedience to you and to your commands, God, let us not forget to tell someone else about you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And all the people said, Amen. 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 Thank you. We're just missed.